Good evening, everyone. My name is Zella Palmer. Uh, I am the director and chair of the Dillard University Ray Charles Program in African American Material Culture. This evening, we have a special guest joining us, Dr. Melinda Lowry. Uh, we are so excited to have her join us. I am um, elated. I am super fangirling. I am um, you know, some of our listeners are, are listening in from in from New Orleans, from North Carolina, from all around the country. And I just wanted to read a little bit about her bio and I'll tell you why I'm fangirling. Um, Dr. Melinda Maynard Lowry is a historian and documentary film producer who is a member of the Lumbee tribe of North Carolina. In July, 2021, she joined Emory University as the Cahoon Family Professor of, Amer of American History after spending 12 years at UNC Chapel Hill and four years at Harvard University. Her second book, The Lumbee Indians and American Struggle was published by UNC Press in 2018. The book is a survey of Lumbee history from the 18th century to the present, written for a general, for general audience. Her first book, Lumbee Indians in the Jim Crow South, Race, Identity, and the Making of a Nation, UNC Press, 2010. It won several awards, including Best First Book of 2010 in Native American and Indigenous Studies. She has written over 20 book chapters or articles on topics, including American Indian migration and identity, school desegregation, federal recognition, religious music, and food ways, and has published essays for popular audiences in places like the New York Times, Oxford American, and Daily Yonder. She has won fellowships and grants from the Mellon Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Sundance Institute, the Ford Foundation, and others. Films she has produced include the Peabody Award winning A Chef's Life, Somewhere South, Road to Race Day, and the list goes on. Um, I'm so excited to have her this uh, join us this evening. Um, I'm just going to give a huge shout out to North Carolina. Um, my mother's side of the family is from North Carolina, so it's it's such an honor to have her join us this and learn more about the Lumbee tribe in North Carolina and other tribes that are in North Carolina. And a lot of um, listeners might not know who aren't familiar with North Carolina culture that uh, there's huge um, population of indigenous tribes in uh, North Carolina. And we're going to learn is, um, a lot for, about the Lumbee tribe in North Carolina and Dr. Lowry's research. So with further ado, I'm excited to um, introduce Dr. Melinda Maynard Lowry. Hello, everyone. We are having a little technical difficulty around video, but I threw together a little bit of a slide to give at least you could <laughs> look at what I what I looked like when I before COVID when I weighed about 20 fewer pounds than I do right now. Um, you know, we are all hanging in there with this uh, pandemic that's ongoing. And I am so excited to be able to be here, especially to talk with you, Dr. Palmer. Um, as I said a second ago, I mean, this is really kind of a dream come true for me too, you know, because you are well, you're beloved in our community, but also in North Carolina, uh, where many of the people I collaborate with, especially around foodways are so familiar with your work and, um, are just, you know, anyway, when they heard that I was doing this, they all said, oh, it's so I said hi. So hi from Jessalyn and hi from Bax and hi, hi from... <laughs> Hi from Nancy and from, you know, just anyway, lots of, lots of Lumbee. I love North Carolina. I love y'all and I love my lums. <laughs> yeah. And, and we are everywhere. I mean, that's one of the things that I think makes um, our community special is that we wind up one way or another all over the world. And, and I'm, I'm talking right now from Stone Mountain, Georgia where I live on Muskogee land, very proud to be on Muskogee land. Um, and I, as you, as you mentioned, I teach and work at Emory University and I've been here about a year, a little over a year. So it's really been an amazing adventure to move to Georgia and to participate in things like Senate runoff elections, which are interesting, interesting around here. And I'm just learning a lot. So thank you for the invite. Thank you. Um, where should we start? Do you think we should go back in time or we sh should we address some things that feel present 
Let's go, let's go back in time because I do have some students that are listening that are unfamiliar, might be unfamiliar. I did, um, you know, talk to some of my students who are listening about uh, Henry Barry Lowry and Rhoda, strong like Rhoda, all of that. But uh, some of those who might not be listening, I know we also partnered with the Center for Racial Justice at Dillard University and he, um, Dr. Uh, Eshmael, who is listening, as in on this call, um, also invited some of his cohorts. So I would love for um, you to give a brief synopsis of the Lumbee tribe in North Carolina, the brief history, and you know other tribes that are in North Carolina for those who aren't familiar. Sure. Um, so North Carolina is home to eight state and federally recognized Native American nations. Um, it happens to be the state of the United States that is has the largest American Indian population east of the Mississippi. So those eight tribes include the Eastern Band Cherokee, the Lumbee tribe of North Carolina, the Waccamaw tribe of Columbus County, um, the Kohari tribe of Sampson and Harnett counties, the Meharan, which are in the northeastern part of North Carolina, um, the Halawasaponi Nation and Halifax and Warren counties, that's six. And I'm, oh, Saponi Indians of Person County, North Carolina, near um, the Virginia border. And I'm leaving someone out, but I will be able to think of them in a minute. Cherokee, right? I'm, didn't, oh, did I mention Eastern Band Cherokee? No, I don't think so. Okay, yes, and Eastern Band Cherokee, which are of course located in the western part of the state, in the in the North Carolina mountains and the Appalachians. Um, between the eight of us, we have, uh, of course, makes North Carolina one of the oldest continually inhabited inhabited parts of the East Coast. Um, as I mentioned, with the largest Native American population east of the Mississippi. Um, the difference between state and federal recognition is something that means a lot to, to us. Um, and in part, it means a lot because our state recognized tribes have been one way or another petitioning or fighting or, you know, really making uh, a case for federal recognition in the case of the Lumbee tribe since the 1880s. Um, and in, and for our other state recognized tribes also for, for many decades, if not a if not hundred or more years. So we, um, we understand the difference between state and federal recognition, but it's always a continually evolving um, goalpost, as I like to say, because the history of these tribal communities um, is as old as the history of any native nations in the United States. And the ways in which we deal with that history are through um, oral, oral history. We pass on oral traditions, of course. We are everywhere in the documentary record when historians begin to look into our pasts. And then, of course, we have um, our food waste traditions, our musical traditions, our religious traditions, and the other things that help us know who we are. Um, the picture that you see right now actually is of an outdoor drama, me holding a photograph of an outdoor drama called Strike at the Wind. Um, Strike at the Wind talks about a time period in Lumbee history during the Civil War when um, a group of Lumbee, Black, and white uh, men gathered to resist and in some cases overthrow the Confederacy. So, um, I want to just let me just back up one second before telling that story of Strike at the Wind and the Civil War to say that um, this is a map of ancestors of the Lumbees and their locations before about 1715. Um, like many other tribes uh, across the United States, the Lumbees are descendants of multiple tribal communities, and in particular, the ones on this map reflect um, some of the ancestors that we know the most about. So when you think about 
where the where Lumbee territory is here in the southeastern part of the state state. I don't know if you can see my cursor there, but Robinson County is this kind of shaded area um, where I was born and where where our tribal community is headquartered now. This shaded area in the southeastern part of the state really was a refuge in the time before the Civil War when um, following colonization settlement by Europeans. Uh, members of Native American communities began to, to move around quite a bit. Now, migration and trade and um, movement have always been part of Native American history, but European settlement and colonization brought that to a new level with particularly um, warfare, disease, enslavement, many of the things that um, afflicted Native people also caused them to begin to find new homes. And so Robeson County, what is now called Robeson County, where the Lumbee tribe is headquartered, is was a refuge for people from these nations on this map, but also from um, other dozens of nations that occupied the territory that we now think of as North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia. Um, so this is this map, I think, is a nice kind of snapshot to give you an idea of the cultural diversity that Lumbee people have embraced and that is really characteristic of North Carolina as a whole. I did, I, I also forgot to mention the Okanichi Band of Saponi Indians in, in Orange and Alamance counties uh, in the central part of the state. They're on this map, they're among our ancestors, but they are also a present day thriving tribal community uh, in the Piedmont area of North Carolina. All of these communities um, contributed in one way or another to who the Lumbee people are today and also to a number of the other tribal communities that I've mentioned. Um, through that process of disease, warfare, enslavement, a process that we share, of course, with people of African descent who were forced to come to this country, um, Lumbee people established a new kind of community and reestablished in particular their family groups in this very swampy, very flat, very watery area of southeastern North Carolina. Um, it's, um, it's an area that in some ways is a lot like South Georgia or even perhaps in, in some respects, um, the Bayou country of Louisiana where you have uh, water and, and soil flowing together. You know, the idea that people have of native people occupying land, well, of course it's land, but it's also water. <laughs> and our relationships to waterways as native people are, is, is absolutely fundament fundamental to our identities. And um, this area of Southeastern North Carolina where Lumbees are from is full of swamps. It's our, our river known as the Lumber River. Uh, flows through there, and we are able to derive nourishment and and spiritual nourishment, especially from that place, along with this, uh, the it's a, as a site of refuge for escape in some ways and protection from these ravages of colonization. Um, if we think about sort of fast forwarding a number of decades, again back to the to the Civil War time period. Um, a group of Lumbee men joined together to rebel against the Confederacy in part because they were being drafted or conscripted to serve in Confederate um, units to build Fort Fisher. Fort Fisher was um, one of the most, one of the busiest ports of the Confederacy in the Civil War. It was located in the region around Wilmington, North Carolina. And because Wilmington is only about 75 miles from Robeson County, the, um, the state commissioned or rather conscripted Lumbee men as well as black men who were not enslaved to um, build the fort against their will. And so a number of the conscripts that were that went to build Fort Fisher were um, from Robeson County and were members of the Lumbee tribe, in part because the state had outlawed the 
uh, ability of free people of color to carry weapons. Um, so they could not freely, typically freely enlist in the Confederacy. Um, and they were not drafted to serve in the con in Confederate battle units. They were drafted to work as forced laborers. Um, so whether you were a free person of African descent or a free person of native descent or both, you were likely um, drafted to go work at Fort Fisher during the Civil War. And this the group of Lumbee black and white men that banded together to resist the Confederacy were doing so partly out of anger and partly out of a sense of injustice and of their, uh, their treatment by the Confederacy, but they were also responding to several decades of dispossession that are a different kind of, of removal. So many people, when they think about Native people in the Southeastern US, they think about the Trail of Tears and they think about Indian removal as a, as a policy of the 1830s. And what we find in North Carolina is that our tribal people did not migrate away from the state, but they were dispossessed of their property in ways that was in, in some ways similar to what Native people who traveled on the Trail of Tears experienced. Um, that dispossession took the form of things like laws, which did not allow you to carry weapons, even for hunting purposes. So by the Civil War, Native people in Robeson County and elsewhere in the state were, many of them were at a point of starvation. They had not been able to provide for themselves, and that was a form of dispossession. Other forms of dispossession that this group of, of outlaws was resisting were um, the, the taking of, of Native-owned land by by white landowners. And so throughout the 1830s and also 1840s and 1850s before the Civil War, uh, Native people and were owning land in Robinson County, but so were white people. And they were they were really neighbors. There are there are areas of Robinson County that are predominantly native, but there have always been uh, at least a few white families living in those areas. And particularly in times like the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, when when white Americans were taking over our land, there were more there's more and more land owned by white people in uh, native communities in North Carolina. So the the way that uh, these white landowners obtained native land was either through um, um, repossession of based on you know non-payment of taxes or um and of course when the state is not allowing you to make a living by doing things like hunting or uh trading or um collecting debts for example against white people then your household income is declining and you are not able to keep up with those taxes the um repossession for non-payment of taxes. Also, when um, a white person would accuse a native person of a crime, the native person was not able by North Carolina law to testify against that white person and or testify on their own behalf. And so the state could convict the native person and take their land as payment essentially for the crime that they committed. Um, sometimes the land was taken through basically outright theft. So if a, if a neighboring landowner, a neighboring white landowner wished to acquire his Indian neighbor's land, then a white landowner may tie a mule or a pig or a horse <laughs> with that white landowner's brand on the, on the native neighbor's land bring the sheriff over to the native neighbor's house and say, I'm arresting you for stealing my horse, mule, or pig. And the sheriff was not particularly interested in fair play. So the native landowner would settle the case by offering or giving um, the white landowner part of the land in return for this so-called lost property, this lost livestock. And so that was what our people came to call tied mule thefts. Um, and those tied mule incidents were had gone on for decades. And by the Civil War, 
when the Confederacy was now uh, basically kidnapping Lumbee and Black men and sending them to Fort Fisher, this group of um, of Lumbee and Black families just said, "We are we are sick of it. We are tired of it." And so. Um, in 1864 and 1865, a young man named Henry Barry Lowry began to hide out in the swamps with his brothers and with his, uh, with his brothers-in-law, with his cousins and with others who were, who were nearby neighbors in order to just simply resist kidnapping. They didn't want to get captured by the Confederate Home Guard. And so their method was to, to hide in these vast uh, swamplands. Um, as tensions began to escalate between the Confederate Home Guard and this group of Lumbee and Black families, the Confederate Home Guard murdered the father and brother of Henry Barry Lowry, um, men named a, a man named Alan Lowry, uh, Henry Barry's brother William Lowry, and in the process, they tortured his mother Mary Lowry. And after that murder um, and torture of Henry Barry's female relatives. He and, and several others, these are several members of the gang, what we call the Lowry gang, um, they joined together to, to exact revenge on the people who killed Alan and William Lowry. Um, in this, on this slide are three members of the Lowry gang. At the top left-hand side is a man named Eli Ewan. He was also called Shoemaker John. Uh, the man in the middle is a man named George Applewhite. Um, and the man on the right is Calvin Lowry. Uh, I'm sorry, Calvin Oxendine. Calvin Oxendine um, was my great, great uncle. <laughs> because, and I, 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 I trace it that way because my great, great grandfather was Calvin's brother, Henderson. Henderson was also a member of the Lowry gang um, and was Calvin and Henderson were Henry Barry Lowry's first cousins and William's first cousins and Alan's nephews. So there was a strong kind of family impulse to get involved in exacting this kind of retribution around the, to the home guard members who killed Alan and William Lowry. Um, the stories of Shoemaker John and George Applewhite are less well known, but um, George Applewhite was a person who, had, who emancipated himself from slavery and like many others was hiding out in Robinson County. He was married to uh, Calvin and Henderson Oxendine's sister, Betsy, and got, we, we assume got involved in the gang because of that marriage affiliation with, with the Lowry and Oxendine families. Um, I am less familiar with Shoemaker John's story, kind of where he came from, but my understanding is also that he was a free man of color and his nickname Shoemaker indicates that, you know, he had a, he had a trade like many free men of color did in this time period. He was providing a service to his community through um, being a cobbler. So, you know, imagining this, this group of outlaws, they're not so much kind of ragtag ruffians as they as they are young and determined men who are really looking for ways to access freedom that were denied to them and the inciting incident for this for this search for freedom was the murders of Alan and William Lowry and the kind of torture that Mary Lowry experienced at the hands of the home guard so this is their tombstone i i always I go visit it. It's at a beautiful, it's at a beautiful spot near their original homestead, and I've always found it so touching that um, that the family decided to put the word hope on their stone. Um, I feel like if any family had a reason to not be very hopeful, it would be this family. Um, but they were determined to ensure that their legacy was one of not giving up despite the kinds of hardships that they experienced. Um, and so I think within, within that story are the ingredients for um, a kind of origin story that 
Lumbee people really take serious today and which we've reinterpreted in the form of music, art, plays, um, film, you know, all sorts of ways of, of telling that story. We have adopted them, wrestled with them. And, you know, we really think about this time period as something that has shaped who we are today. That's, it's not an origin story in the sense of a, of an, of how we came to be as humans, but it's an origin story in terms of how we came to be um, as a community that we are now. And so I think about what the story represents in terms of um, how we've claimed our territory, how we protect our territory, how we band together with people who are kin, but also who are just neighbors and we desire to keep those people close because our fortunes rise and fall on the fortunes of of our family and our neighbors um and to me that's a lot of what the lowry gang as a group represents but also kind of what this story represents um i could pause there i could keep going you know there's a lot <laughs> i'm gonna open it up for q a um afterwards you know so after your presentation but i mean it's fascinating I'm, I'm loving it i know everybody else says we have 33 people listening in oh good i wish i could see y'all but we anyway <laughs> it's um I'll, I'll say a little bit more about the 20th century so fast forwarding in lumbee history um Lumbee people were subject to a form of racial segregation that is very familiar to black southerners in particular um, but it's something that is, is, you've also seen it all over the world. You've seen it in places like South Africa with apartheid. You've seen it in places like Australia with the way that their Aboriginal population has been segregated. Um, you even see it, of course, out West when you think about the, uh, the phenomenon of border towns and border reservation communities and the ways in which white settlements on the outskirts of native communities would not include or incorporate native people into their into their communities. Um, so segregation, sometimes people think of this as a uniquely Southern phenomenon, but it's really all over the world. And the ways in which race has become a kind of a black and white binary is something that help, doesn't really help us understand, I think, the segregation as a global phenomenon and racial discrimination as a global phenomenon. So I talk about this period of segregation in the Lumbee community as a way to remind us that before people could become segregated, they had to be understood as members of racial categories. And so race is not necessarily something that um, defines us as human beings, except for the ways in which it's been used to oppress us. Um, I think indigenous people are members of many kinds of communities, but we, but we first interacted with, um, with people, with non-indigenous people in this continent as members of political communities. So when you think about uh, tri-racial segregation in Robeson County, North Carolina, a lot of a lot of um, lies had to be told in order to create this system, and those are lies that affect Black Americans as well as Native Americans. And so I talk about this time period because I'm especially interested in helping us understand the ways in which racial identity is something that can be uh, claimed and understood and reinterpreted, and it's not necessarily a fixed biological category that we need to um, that we need to see as a fact. We can see it as um, as something that we can we can claim and we can own, but we can also reinterpret it when we need to. And so, I think racial segregation in Robinson County helps us understand that. Um, phenomenon or that, that those ideas about race. And also I'll just tell you a little bit about this time period. Um, following the Lowry War, what, when, we, when we think about that civil war kind of rebellion against the Confederacy, it extended until the 1870s. It wasn't over until 1872. And um, 
the Lowry War caused, a, you know, a great deal of damage in Robeson County in the sense that um, conservative uh, and con ex and, and former Confederate white families lost um, lost their men to this war because the Lowry Gang was successful in its uh, attempts to exact retribution on the killers of Allen and William Lowry. And so Lumbee people became known at this point, at this time for um, their willingness to use violence and also for their willingness to defend their territory. After, this, after the Lowry War ended um, and reconstruction ended with the takeover of Democrats um, in the North Carolina state legislature, Democrats began thinking about ways that they could recruit Lumbee people to vote Democrat, which, you know, is pretty cynical strategy that we see still today. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that um, that set Lumbee people apart during the Reconstruction period was our willingness to vote Republican. We were not trying to vote with the conservative Democrats that had started and 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 lost the Civil War. Um, they were, you know, trying to inaugurate a kind of new political regime in North Carolina. But when Reconstruction ended, the Republican Party in North Carolina hung on. And we, we are learning more, for example, about the 1898 Wilmington massacre and the role of that massacre in, uh, in determining the one-party system in North Carolina, a one-party system that supported only Democratic candidates. Um, and around that same time in the 1880s and 1890s, Democrats who were trying to hold on to power in North Carolina began to look at the Lumbee community and say, how can we convince you to vote with us rather than to vote with Republicans? The, um, the main tool that they had in their arsenal was education. And the North Carolina Constitution guaranteed separate schooling for Black and white North Carolinians, but it basically left native North Carolinians out of the picture altogether. And so Lumbee uh, families, Lumbee parents, decided that they wanted to continue their tradition of sending native kids to native run schools. Um, before public education was widely available in North Carolina, native people were uh, founding and establishing their own their own schools, sometimes in, in churches or in homes or in, in other ways um, that, that met their needs. But when public education became widely available and separate schooling systems were not provided for native children, native parents said, we want our kids to go to school with people like them. We don't want them to go to school with African-Americans. We don't want them to go to school with whites. We want them to go with other Indians. So the Democratic Party began to see that as a tool that they could use to convince uh, Native people to vote for Democrats. And so in the 1880s, the uh, state legislature of North Carolina passed a law which recognized uh, the, the Lumbee tribe, then called the Croatan tribe, but recognized the Lumbee tribe as, as, a, as an Indian community and at the same time established a school uh, now known as North, University of North Carolina at Pembroke, um, but established a school by and for Native people. And so that school was officially chartered by state law in 1887 uh, right along with the set with the law in 1885 that recognized native Lumbee people as as native officially. Um, and Democrats were responsible for getting that for introducing that bill for getting that bill passed for securing some of the same some of the early very modest funding for uh, for the school at Pembroke um, and gradually you know, still a long time before Lumbee people began to vote Democrat altogether, but gradually they began to vote Democrat. In the early 1900s, when um, right after the Wilmington Massacre of 1898, the state legislature passed a set of laws which denied the vote to African-Americans. 
uh, Democrats came to Robeson County and campaigned on that issue. And they began to say, if you don't vote for us, we will disenfranchise you just like we did uh, black voters. And with that type of argument, I think native people in Robeson County stopped arguing. <laughs> I think they said they took that threat seriously and they said, okay, we will vote, you know, for, we will vote democratic. And as we, as we know, when you study uh, segregation in the South, in Southern states, it was the Democratic Party that prided itself on being the party of white supremacy, that prided itself on upholding segregation. People sort of forget this now because of the, the sort of record that the Republican Party is upholding. But, you know, in fact, it was the Democrats in this region for, for 70, 80 or more years who were responsible for upholding racial segregation. And and they were able to do that because blacks were not allowed to vote. They were able to do it in North Carolina because Lumbees were voting for Democrats. Um, and when Lumbees were allowed, while Lumbees were allowed to vote, they were also not allowed to run their own candidates for office. So the so the vote was it's very much a a kind of um, double edged sword, you know, to support. Democrats and when they are securing your rights to have your own school system and also your right to vote, you actually are at the same time denied very little, denied very much um, actual political agency under that under that kind of bargain. But um, I think Native people took their took their um, the the seriousness which with which Lumbee people approached education had its own kind of rewards. Um, for us. And so that college that I mentioned, which is now UNC Pembroke, became the first four-year institution founded by and for Native people in the United States. Um, it began awarding four-year degrees in 1929, and that's actually, my grandfather was part of that uh, graduating class of 1929, and that makes me the granddaughter of a college graduate, which is really pretty phenomenal um, when you think about, especially the, the educational outcomes for Native people nationally. Um, it means that Lumbee people have been able to explore economic opportunities far outside the kind of farming and preaching which was available to, to our ancestors, you know, those who could not obtain college degrees. And so Early on, you know, uh, the first the first Lumbee doctor actually to receive a, an MD was uh, in the 1880s, you know, and uh, he got his education at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. But this he he was sort of a trailblazer with, you know, many more to follow. And I think Lumbee people take a great deal of pride in in their schools and their education, um, especially in their college and in their, in their passion for education, um, because we recognize that it's one of the things that help us exercise our autonomy as native people. Um, so, you know, what I've explored, especially in my first book was the, the upsides and the downsides of that kind of bargain that, that our ancestors made with Democrats in order to sustain our own school system. Um, in some ways, it certainly promoted autonomy and control over our own affairs. In other ways, it made our affairs beholden to what pleased white Democrats. And so when in the 1970s, uh, when native people began to say, hey, we don't need to vote for Democrats anymore. There are some Republicans running uh, for state office or running for our district or running from the, for the Congress and we wanna support them, you know, it also ties the political fortunes of native people in Southeastern North Carolina to, um, to another political party, which doesn't always have its own interests, have, have their interests at heart. So the hallmark of segregation for native people uh, in the 20th century was very much about maintaining autonomy, but doing so in a deeply compromised way that prevented us in some respects from exercising our, from, from exercising 
leadership, I would say, over that autonomy. Um, in the middle of this time period, another, another incident occurred that Lumbees are getting kind of more well known for. Um, even though we were complying with segregation in order to maintain our school system um, and maintain the right to vote, we were also actively resisting, violently resisting the, the work of white nationalists like the Ku Klux Klan. So in the 1950s, the Ku Klux Klan, you know, was really probably the most well-known American terrorist group. Um, they, as, as, everyone, I think, as I hope everyone knows, they were active throughout the country, particularly the South, but not just in the South. Some of the largest Ku Klux Klan chapters have been in places like Indiana um, or Southern Ohio, places like that. But particularly in the South, of course, the Klan was very visible in the 1950s as the, the leading group resisting the implementation of the Supreme Court's Brown v. Board decision and the desegregation of American society that was taking place in the wake of that decision. The Ku Klux Klan was out there saying, we won't have it. And, and they were a very dangerous organization. In Southeastern North Carolina, they were led by a man named Catfish Cole. Um, and Catfish Cole decided that he wanted to take a stand against a group like the Lumbees because we did not fit in. He called us mongrels, um, and he he declared that Lumbee women had loose morals. Um, those were his words, and he felt that it was necessary for the Ku Klux Klan to demonstrate its power by putting us in our place. Um, and I don't think he quite understood what that what that actually means to Lumbee people. We are, we defend our place. <laughs> when you try to come into our place and, and take over, you are going to get put out. Um, so in January of 1958, uh, Catfish Cole and, and the Ku Klux Klan burned crosses on the homes of two Lumbee families. One family who had moved into a, bought a home and moved into a white neighborhood and another a cross on the lawn of a Lumbee woman who was dating a white man. Um, after those two cross burnings, he decided that he was going to hold a rally in Robinson County. Originally, he wanted to hold it kind of in the heart of the Lumbee community, but it was not possible. He could not find a white landowner that was going to rent him a field for that purpose. So he moved the rally to a place called Hayes Pond, right outside the town of Maxton, North Carolina. Um, Maxton is just on the border of Robinson County, just to the west, and um, Maxton also hosted a, a number of Klan members at that time, and Catfish Cole rented this field. Uh, actually, the sheriff of Robinson County traveled to, to Cole's home in South Carolina and asked him to cancel the rally. He said that the, the sheriff said that he would not protect Catfish Cole or the Klan, and their so-called free speech rights um, because he didn't believe in what they were doing. And the Lumbees had declared their intention to stand up against the Klan violently if necessary. And the sheriff wanted to communicate to Catfish Cole that he would not receive, be receiving the protection of law enforcement. But Catfish Cole did not cancel the rally. He, he arrived that night, but rather than the several hundred Klan members that he expected, only about 50 Klan members showed up and they brought their families with them. They brought their wa you know, wives and children. Um, they also brought their weapons because they had been understanding that the Lumbees were going to challenge them there. And of course that's what happened. So several hundred Lumbees, maybe as many as 500, including probably 50 women, um, met the, the Ku Klux Klan at this field at Hayes Pond. And when Catfish Cole went to speak over the small PA system he had set up, this man on the on the right in the black jacket, um, Sanford Locklear, shot out the light bulb next to Catfish Cole with his rifle. Um, Mr. Sanford was a World War II veteran, as was his cousin, this man in the center of the image, Neil Lowry. 
And that night, the Lumbee men who traveled there, many of them were World War II veterans who had fought, who had, you know, had seen people die and had family members and friends die in the war. And they were simply not going to allow this kind of, um, this kind of Ku Klux Klan activity to occur on their territory. Um, so Mr. Sanford, Mr. Neil Lowry and others um, fired their guns in the air. It's really a miracle that no one got killed that night. I think people were prepared for that kind of violence, but um, the fact that it didn't happen is, is probably not due to some kind of restraint, <laughs> but probably just to the mercy of God. Um, and and the fact that um, and the, the Klan really had an appropriate response rather than than fight back, they fled and catfish coal in particular fled into the swamps on foot surrounding the field and he didn't come out for two days. Um, the sort of oral tradition is that he brought his wife Carolyn and his children with them and his wife was so frightened that she drove her car into a ditch. And Lumby men actually pulled her and her car out of the ditch um, because Catfish had, had absconded. Um, a few months later, Catfish Cole was actually tried in Robinson County Superior Court for inciting a riot. And he was found guilty. And you know this really surprised um, observers at the time because the Ku Klux Klan had received so much legal and law enforcement protection up to this point. Um, but you know, this was at least one incident, one one effort in which many people across society banded together to denounce this kind of activity. Um, Lumbee people, it, for for Lumbee people, especially of course this group that showed up that night, it was um, it was everyone's intention to make sure that this kind of thing never happened again. And so the Klan has never held a public rally in Robinson County since then. Um, and I, you know, I don't expect we ever will. So, you know, just as Lumbee people are living with segregation, trying to understand what it means for them, taking advantage of that system where it seemed to make sense, they're also resisting uh, white supremacy in very concrete ways. Um, and, you know, I think that sort of push and pull around around racial issues continues in our homelands to this day so i can sort of take questions we could you know i'm happy to to talk more there's so obviously we'll, a lot to say if 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 um you all can start putting in the q a if you have questions um that was a brief history i mean dr lowry you know, covered a huge, um, you know, span of history uh, to give you all a brief history of um, the Lumbee tribe in North Carolina and just their place in North Carolina, along with uh, the other eight tribes that are in North Carolina as well, whether state or federally recognized. Um, I would love for us, of course, to talk about the food. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I know but you live in Georgia. I live in New Orleans. I miss collard sandwiches. I miss <laughs> <I'm too. laughs> So uh, I would love for you to talk about, you know, just uh, food ways and food sovereignty and, you know, um, how Lumbee's, uh, you know, you talked a lot about how they defend, defended their land. And, you know, I would love to read to talk about how did they defend their food ways as well. Yeah. Um, you know, this is a this is a somewhat recent interest of mine in in trying to understand the relationship between history and foodways and Lumbee culture and community and our foodways. Um, I think it really connects to what is fundamental about Southern food, which is that there is no Southern food. There is only native food and African food. <laughs> and the ways in which those things combine with a little bit of influence from Europe, you know, the influence from Europe is mainly around around proteins, but it's still not that tremendous. Um, you have, we have chicken and pork and beef because of Europe, but we, we have deer because of, of indigenous people. You know, we have so many of the vegetables and the grains we enjoy, rice, 
collards, uh, you, you know, on and on. They come from Africa. And then, of course, the staple of, of Southern cooking is, is corn, you know, and corn is a, a plant developed and grown um, here, starting, of course, with our, our relatives in the Central American part of the hemisphere. Um, but a, about 3,000 years ago, corn began to be farmed everywhere south of, um, well, it's farmed in upstate New York, but, you know, in particular, it grows, I think, 40 weeks out of the year south of uh, Missouri or so. So the Mississippi Valley, you know, all the way over to the Atlantic Ocean, this is really kind of um, the, the heart of the of the ingredient that has become so influential the world over. Um, so, you know, Lumbee cuisine is, is all about corn, like much of Southern cuisine is, but, you know, we do, th we do things that, um, that other Southerners do, we just do them in a kind of distinct way. So in the top, the top um, left corner, you see a picture of the collared sandwich, which is this <laughs> lovely delicacy. Um, with two pieces of fried cornbread, we kind of fry our cornbread in uh, sort of flat discs in a way, kind of crispy, crispy, excuse me, crispy on the edges and kind of soft in the center. So a, a collard sandwich is not made with light bread, it's made with cornbread and in particular fried cornbread. And then when Lumbees cook collards, we don't tend to stew them um, in, in water. We tend to chop them really, really finely, almost like a chiffonade, you know, we kind of stack all the leaves together and then roll it up into a thick, a thick log and then um, kind of very, very thinly slice that those greens. Um, and so it, it means that the collars can cook pretty quickly when you just sort of, um, we call it fry them, but we're not deep frying them, we're stir frying them, I guess. And, you know, you fry them a little bit, you steam them a little bit, you throw some salt, a little, maybe a little sugar, some fat back in there. Uh, and you've got a really delicious collard green that, that retains some of that, some of that bitterness, you know, but if it's not, if, it, if you've gotten your greens after the frost has hit them, then they're not nearly as bitter. They're, they're actually quite sweet and they just retain that flavor that we love so much and that goes really well with the, the little bit of sweetness of the corn and the cornbread. So the collard sandwich is, if you haven't had one, go find one. Come to Lumbee Homecoming. We have Lumbee Homecoming every year, um, or at least certainly since COVID, we've been able to start it back up again. And that's um, that happens around July 4th every year. So, you know, we have things like the collard sandwich, but we also, we also enjoy all the other foods that kind of so-called traditional Southerners, you know, enjoy fried chicken, potato salad, every type of, you know, every type of vegetable that we can grab from the garden all year round. Uh, sweet potatoes, the, the number of Lumbee stories about sweet potatoes is kind of amazing. Uh, it's just such a staple food in our communities and we have, you know, two dozen ways of preparing them. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, when I think of Lumbee food, I think of that collard sandwich, but I, I, most, I mostly think of the ingredients and I mostly think about trying to honor the places where they came from, you know, um, Africa and, and Central America. Absolutely. And, you know, and I'm, I'm also curious to learn more also about how, um, if you could speak a little bit about just how um, Lumbee farmers, you know, perhaps, and, you know, I know, I don't think some people who are listening are, who aren't familiar with North Carolina might not be familiar with tobacco and how mm -hmm. tobacco is such a huge crop in uh, North Carolina. And I know there's a lot of young Lumbee farmers that are, uh, you know, working towards, you know, owning their own farms or, you know, or, or just really returning to the land. So I would yeah. love to possibly talk about that. Yeah. So, you know, uh, my parents both grew up farming tobacco and um, prior to the tobacco master settlement agreement of the when was that mid 90s 
um, when the federal government began to buy out tobacco companies and tobacco farmers in order to, you know, decrease the country's dependence on cigarettes, um, tobacco was an absolutely staple crop in our communities. And so tobacco was so profitable um, in part for a long time because it was labor intensive, but many, many different members of a family could work in tobacco. And for many years anyway, it didn't require a lot of heavy machinery to do. And so my father's family, for example, my grandfather who graduated from college in 1929, uh, mostly farmed tobacco. <laughs> he was, you know, he was a teacher in the Lumbee schools, but I think he saw his real occupation as, as in some ways as a tobacco farmer, because that was something that really provided income for his family. Um, and teaching was, was, was important sort of emotionally for the family or it's emotionally part of what he what he imagined for his descendants future was that they would be educated people but in terms of where the subsistence came from it came from tobacco um and so in particular my father and his siblings spent hours and hours and hours in different parts of the tobacco industry uh, my mother as well my mother um my mother's parents farm was much smaller it was only 22 acres and it was enough to grow vegetables you know so they they acquired most of their diet from what they were able to grow but they would uh help other farm other farming families who had a tobacco allotment a piece of land that uh could that was where they were allowed to farm tobacco so they got some income from tobacco farming as well, even though it wasn't as intensive for them as it was for my father's family. Um, but the stories that go along with that, you know, are, that's mo much of what I heard when I was growing up. When I think about Lumbee history and the, the sort of the first lessons of Lumbee history that I heard, it was, you know, what it was like barning tobacco, what it was like tying tobacco, what it was like cropping tobacco, what it was, you know, the the sense in which um and cotton as well but cotton i think uh, tobacco is more like a 13 month crop is what they call it you can stay busy working on tobacco all year long to cotton is more seasonal um but cotton was you know families farmed cotton as well as tobacco but they um you know the the idea of kids coming together to help each other work on the farm before school so they could all go to school that day right because in a farming family um many many times parents had to keep their children home from school because they could not afford to lose that day's labor and the children had to stay home to help in the fields and some of the first sort of history lessons i remember are just about that what do we do to help each other how do we help each other? Why is it important to help each other? And in my family, it was my dad and his siblings and his cousins getting together at dawn to all work together so all of them could go to school that day, you know, rather than one of them having to stay behind or or a couple of them have to stay having to stay behind. Everybody would pitch in to the, so they could all go, you know, and um, that sense of like helping one another and working working together to achieve a common goal is just so um, visceral from my understanding of history. I think I look for it. <laughs> I look for it in documents. I look for it in places where it's not likely to appear um, because it was such an enduring part of my childhood, hearing about that, that life of farming tobacco and, and what it meant. Thank you for that. We have one question from Wesley, and he said, could you say again, which point, in which point in time were Native Lumbee people allowed to go to universities and or public schooling? Yeah, so um, Lumbees began to, 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 uh, to establish and attend their own publicly funded schools in the 1880s. Um, that was, you know, and I think to think of them as schools, schools is a little bit of an elaborate word in the sense that somebody might have been meeting in a, as I said, in a church 
or in a tobacco barn or in any kind of location where uh, people could gather, there was often, you know, just a, just a few people and a teacher in the very first uh, days. And this, this are, sometimes people would start school when they were 11 or 12 or 13. They wouldn't have had the opportunity to go because they had to work on the farm younger than that. Um, or sometimes kids would start when they were, you know, what we think of as school age today, five or six or seven, you know. And so um, it, Lumbee education in some, in some ways was kind of a very much a do-it-yourself kind of operation, not, not robustly funded by, uh, the, by public funds. But then when the University of North Carolina at Pembroke was established also in the 1880s, it was particularly established because Lumbee people knew that they needed a system to train Lumbee teachers. And uh, segregation was most robustly upheld, I think, when teachers and, and school children were members of the same racial community. Um, I think that was a kind of a core tenet of what white supremacy thought of as a proper educational system. And so Lumbees knew that if they were to sustain these schools, they needed Lumbee teachers. They couldn't depend on white teachers um, or black teachers. So that early university, UNC, what became UNC Pembroke, was founded as a college to train Lumbee teachers. And it began actually, it was about, it was almost 40 years um, before they started granting four-year degrees. And those four-year degrees began being granted in 1929. You also talk a little bit, um, I wanna go back in history, you know, um, North Carolina um, is, you know, port capital of the US as far as, you know, uh, the world uh, really, mm -hmm. um, you know, and we, I, when I talk to my students, we talk a lot about, about the killing of buffalo and bison and, you know, and just how, um, you know, food sovereignty is in indigenous communities and how it was also a calculated genocide and policy to kill um, bison, you know. Um, right. Could you talk a little bit about just, you know, the pork industry in North Carolina and how, um, cause you talked about starvation as well during the time, um, you know, the Civil War and before that and just how it was calculated and policy to remove land, to do all of these, um, you know, tactics to make sure that um, white supremacy continued. Right. And, and denying people their own food and their own story of food is part of that. You know, I think um, one of the most pernicious effects of dispossession in the Lumbee community has been to deny people the opportunity to grow their own food. And one of the other things that characterized the segregation time period was um, a huge population of Lumbee sharecroppers. So prior to the Civil War, prior to the, the time period I mentioned with tied mule thefts and other things, of course, all of the land was owned by Native people at one time, <laughs> you know, prior to the arrival of Europeans, um, and particularly the American Revolution, much, much, much more land was owned by Native people, and we have records of that. We have documentary records of that. After the American Revolution, um, especially when whites began to, to settle, to concentrate their settlements in and around Lumbee settlements in Robinson County, the land very quickly passed out of native hands and into white hands to the point where by 1930, for example, you probably had a Lumbee population, 80% of which was farming a white landowner's land as a sharecropper or a renter. And only about 20% were landowners, 20% of Lumbees were landowners themselves. So um, segregation was uh, a crucial element of eroding our, our food sovereignty, uh, just simply eroding our ability to grow our own food because the land we were farming had to be, um, had to be planted according to the desires of the white landowner who was interested in making money off of 
cotton, tobacco, or other kinds of crops. Um, so typically sharecropping families were given sometimes less than a quarter acre, which is not enough to grow food to feed a, a group of six, much less 12 um, family members. And that desire to that desire to plant cash crops instead of food crops meant that through the 20th century, Lumbee communities became food deserts, which is really ironic, <laughs> you know, given the um, ex given the high degree of expertise we have around growing our own food, but also the um, the ways in which this abundance was once under our control. Not that we didn't share it with other people. We were that, that ethic of sharing that I talked about has always been part of Lumbee culture, even of course with non-native people. So it, you know, it wasn't that we were not willing to share what we had, it's that what we what we had had been taken away from us. Um, and along with that, of course, literally the land on which to grow the food, but also um, the mechanisms of of distributing food and otherwise sharing food. The Henry Barry Lowry story is was also, um, it's also treasured in our community because Henry Barry and his, his brothers and cousins were people who were known for uh, stealing food from white landowners and redistributing it to black and Lumbee families. Um, and, you know, the idea of people locking up resources in smoke houses and not sharing is just anathema to us, especially on our own land, when that land was taken illegally. And so during the Civil War, Henry Berry and others kind of worked hard to redistribute that food. And that was part of the rebellion and part of the reason why um, law enforcement and others resented Lumbee so much during that time period. Um, you know, speaking about the the pork industry in North Carolina, it's it's I'm not I'm not a deep specialist there, but you know I also I think I see the ironies like everyone else does who who drives through that um, through that area. You know, sustainable pork is one thing, and there are lumby um, lumby farmers who are working on sustainable meat products and providing them to to restaurants and to to markets and other kinds of um, outlets. But I think the mass production of, of uh, pork that we see now is such an environmental threat in terms of um, methane, um, hog waste and lagoons, and the ways in which, again, it takes land out of the circulation for vegetable production and locks it up in an industrial um, workflow that is never, it's, it's, it's almost never owned by native people in that community and often exploits people of color in that community, black and brown people, um, more recent immigrants from uh, Central and South America and Mexico, you know, people who are also indigenous, um, <laughs> but they are from other nations, you know, they've come to Eastern North Carolina um, and are also experiencing some of the ill effects of, of the pork industry. So there's, there's a lot to unpack there. It's just, um, it's, it's pretty intense. And, and the ability to try to reclaim it is something that, as you mentioned, Dr. Palmer, people are really working hard on. So Lumbee farmers are growing vegetables, they are selling them in markets, they are producing all kinds of things like jams and jellies and, you know, products from that, from that produce. Um, and they're, I think, interestingly, again, and somewhat ironically, becoming more known for doing the thing that we've always done all along. Thank you for that. And, you know, and when, since we're talking about material culture as well, and uh, the Ray Charles program is a material culture program, I wanted you to talk a little bit also about the preservation of, of, of powwows, of how sacred it is, um, you know, for indigenous tribes to be able to wear regalia again. I remember I was um, with Mr. Greg and Jesselyn 
and you know the um, tribal chairman for uh, the Kohari tribe in North Carolina, and he invited mm -hmm. us out to um, you know the, they had a PBS documentary that was filming him, and he was talking about just how grateful he is that his granddaughter, you know, in this this generation, is able to wear regalia with pride at um, a powwow. And before, you know, he said he would, you know, be ostracized, um, you know, insecure about wearing regalia, you know, and it's just, it was really, and of course it was illegal for um, quite some time not to even have powwow. So to have Lumbee homecoming and to have, you know, powwows is pretty, you know, across the nation is uh, something that is new in this, um, it hasn't, you know, it hasn't been happening for a long time. Right, right. I mean, you know, when Mr. Greg drops some wisdom <laughs> about his life experience, <laughs> you know, you, you have to stop and listen. I mean, you know, the ethics of um, mutuality that were present in our, in our farming communities and our educational systems and our religious systems you know, Lumbees and other tribes in North Carolina have have adopted Christianity. And so when you travel to a native community there today, you are you're seeing Christian churches, you know, you're seeing Christian expressions of of faith and and belief. Um, and we continue to adopting Christianity has been a way for us to maintain, I think, our consistent desire to stay in spiritual connection with the earth mother um, and also with one another. So I, I made a film, gosh, now it's gonna be 20 years in, 19, in 2026. Um, I'm sorry, 30 years, <laughs> but it's, you know, I made a film almost 30 years ago that is about, that was about powwow singing and Lumbee Christian singing. Um, and the relationship between those two things, because when I was growing up and going to college and, you know, being surrounded by non-Native people, there was a question like, how, how can you be Indian and Christian at the same time? Like, weren't these the people that came and took your religion or took everything away from you? And I always thought that was kind of a sad question because the people didn't seem to know that we had, we had some control over <laughs> over our religious beliefs and they didn't seem to understand that um we were exercising creativity and agency throughout that whole period of our traditional religions and certain kinds of life ways being outlawed um that as those as those traditional religions life ways languages you know became less and less spoken and more and more derided by the mainstream society we were finding lots and lots of creative ways to keep them going and so you know when I think about a Lumbee powwow today I think it's, it's a place where you can go get a collared sandwich you know it's a place where you can go purchase a basket or observe the ways in which um, Lumbee basket makers weavers and others are making those traditional crafts um, using the materials that we have found, you know, that that creator has provided for us throughout that whole time period of not of not being allowed to do what we what we knew um, our spiritual traditions had guided us to do. So, you know, being able now to see elders like Mr. Greg feel that degree of pride and relief, you know, I, I'm fortunate that I don't know what that was like you know I don't know what it was like to 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 be told that you can't do this you know I was able to grow up and make a film about it you know as opposed to um having to hide it and I think we can when we hear those kinds of stories and we we sort of bear witness to the sense of relief that our that our elders feel we need to take that seriously and remember that the things that we enjoy now you know, our, it was only recently that uh, people could participate in those kinds of gatherings and feel safe doing so. Okay, so thank you for that. So I have lots of questions and I will hopefully get through all of them this evening. Um, Malaya, she wanted to know what is your favorite memory growing up 
um, and I, growing up in that era of time, I, mm. yeah. Well, you know, for me, I'm kind of a, I joke with my brother sometimes that we're kind of like Jim Crow survivors. You know, we, our parents were raised in the time period of segregation, but for us, we were born in the seventies. And so there was a lot of segregation that was still present, you know, um, but we were also, my parents raised us in a city about two hours away from Durham. I'm sorry, from Robinson County. So we were raised in the city of Durham. Um, and my favorite memory uh, is really kind of riding around the county visiting relatives and sitting with them as they would just go through old photographs and photo albums and listening to them even just list the names of these people you know and I, I would say to myself gosh I'll never remember these people's names <laughs> and I don't remember all of them you know I, but it's amazing what I was able to pick up by simply kind of overhearing grown-ups, you know, grown folks talk, right? So overhearing grown folks talk about things that mattered to them um, was definitely my favorite memory. And it's a lot of why I became a historian. So I could just sort of do that in a different way. You know, I could do that in an archive or I could do it with oral history or, you know, I could hear overhear people talk about the past. Um, that's why I wanted to do what I'm doing now, I think. Okay, thank you. And Raven wants to know what is one word you will do, you would use to define the Lumbee culture and why? Oh, that's such a good question. I mean, it's actually a phrase, and it's it's who's your people. Um, <laughs> so when when one Lumbee meets another, our first question to each other is always who's your people, and who's your people is just a way for you to define your kin folks, your kin group, and try to figure out how you might be related or at least known to that other person's kin group or kin folks. So, you know, and most of the time when we when we answer the who's your people question, we only have to go back one or two generations, say, oh, my parents were or my uncle and aunts or or my grandparents or some of my you would name some of your grandparents, brothers and sisters. Um but sometimes you have to go back quite a long ways and think about the places that those ancestors have lived over time. So our community is actually made up of multiple smaller communities. Um, and so when I say that I'm the granddaughter of Foy and Bloss Cummings from the St. Anna community and the granddaughter of Wayne and Lucy Maynard from the Red Banks community, then that enables the person I'm talking to to say, okay, now, did your, you know, did your mama go to Pembroke High School? What, what year did she graduate? You know, because that person's mother or grandmother might have gone to Pembroke High School and thought, which was an Indian only school at the time, and, you know, segregated, and they might be able to make a connection that way. Or we might be able to make a connection because we are actually blood kin to one another. We just have to go back a little bit of ways on the family trees. Um, and I think this concept is so important because the way that we know ourselves as Lumbee people, our identity is really founded on our families and our relationships to place. Um, you know, we there's sort of a, a saying that's getting more traction now that being Indian is not who you claim, it's who claims you. And Lumbee people have been exercising that principle forever, you know, because we don't know who we are unless we know who claims us. And so that who's your people question, it gets to the heart of it every single time, I think. Thank you for that. And I, I think it, you know, and for those who are listening, I know there's some who, um, you know, moved to Baltimore, Detroit, Indianapolis, and, you know, like you, Dr. Lowry, now in Atlanta, I'm sure there's some lums in Atlanta as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so who's your people? And I'm sure people who are listening, who are listening and even from New Orleans, I mean, that's definitely, you know, the people always ask, what's your last name, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. usually in, um, you know, Lumbee culture, it's uh, the last names as well. Locklear, Oxidai, Lowry is uh, also, you know, kind of signatures to that, to the culture. Yes, absolutely. Surnames are so important. We're all kind of um, 
we're all kind of part-time genealogists because we carry around those genealogies in our in our memories. Absolutely. Uh, Olympia wants to know, do you believe that denying people the opportunity to grow their own food is similar to not having organic foods in low income neighborhoods in terms of the negative impacts it produces? I think so. I mean, I think I think it's it reaches the impact reaches a little beyond uh, not just organic foods, but, you know, the problem with food insecurity and food deserts is really just fresh food, period. Um, produce or other other types of foods where you can get those crucial, you know, vitamins and minerals, um, fiber and other kinds of things that just keep us healthy on a daily basis. The uh, crisis in the Lumbee community has been, I think, the very, very, very similar to low-income communities all over in the sense of what we have are um, foods that are made with a lot of preservatives. You know, we have um, packaged foods. We have um, sodas. Anyway, you know, we have we have the same thing in in places in our community that um, I see in neighborhoods that I've lived in across the country. If it was, you know, the Bay Area of California or uh, here in Georgia or in the Northeast, you know, there are definitely um, food insecure communities that I'm seeing in a lot of ways have the same kind of availability of food that we do. You also talk a little bit about uh, just gentrification and, you know, just what's happening in North Carolina as far as uh, tech industries moving to North Carolina and, you know, new people kind of coming in, not understanding that the indigenous tribes have been there for quite some time. I remember talking with um, a friend of mine's brother, and he was just talking about how he works in um, Durham and, you know, somebody from New York had moved to uh, North Carolina and, you know, worked with him and just said, oh, you know, um, I didn't even know Indians were still around. <laughs> right? And he said, well, you're looking at what? <laughs> you know, and that's the same thing I heard in the 1990s when I went to college in Boston. It was, I thought all y'all were dead. You know, it's like, there are no Indians in North Carolina. It's like, wow, okay. Um, yeah, you know, I think that that is a reflection of um, of the ways in which information is segmented in our society, you know, and also the the difficulties people are finding around teaching honest histories in public school settings, you know, are are even and even in colleges. I mean, our our tracks, the tracks that so many of my students are on, are pre professional tracks where they don't take history you know they they have to be especially interested or have a particular love for something in the humanities or social sciences to for it to be considered valuable because they're trying to go to med school or they're you know they're trying to enter the health sciences or another field that requires a particular set of courses that doesn't really enrich their um their knowledge of the world around them you know in terms of the people certainly the people around them so um you know, I think that limitation on teaching honest history, while it's not, while we're not facing the same kind of surveillance in many college classrooms as K-12 classrooms are, the, the kind of lack of people's historical education, especially about Native people, it tends to start very young. And then unless students are really intentional about gaining some insight because of maybe they've heard a talk like this one, or they've seen a powwow or they've been you know they've become aware in some way shape or form that native communities are still alive and well you know they really have to to seek out those resources um and so that's you know one of the things that i am the most interested in is is trying to support the visibility of native people in every kind of setting you know i think i think arts and entertainment is a really exciting venue right now for featuring Native people. So if I think about a series like Reservation Dogs or Rutherford Falls or a film like Prey on Hulu, you know, these are ways for Native people to 
really express themselves in ways that seem true to them and also reach audiences that unfortunately have not had a lot to think about or say about say when it comes to um, native issues and native communities. But we hope will, you know, because we're all, you know, it's not just about recognizing people who have been invisible. It's also about solving huge problems like climate change or food insecurity or, you know, um, the the kind of um, the kind of political systems that we're living with that divorce people from their homelands and put you know force them to leave. There's a lot of answers for those human conditions in native communities. Answers, but also just really important questions that people can ask to help address problems in their own lives. I would love to see a, uh, a movie one day, uh, the Lowry uh, Wars. On yes. That would the, be, oh, that would be amazing. That would be um, pretty cool. Yeah, that would be so cool. Uh, you know, I, I want to talk, you mentioned uh, music and, you know, I'm going to tie in uh, the last question for the evening uh, from Demetrius. And he was asking what it's like to be at a Lumbee celebration and what type of music and food would you have there? I, I know it's a general question, but I wanted to also tie in. I see a picture of Char Charlie Lowry with your beautiful daughter. Yes. And Charlie is such an incredible um, singer as well as Alexis Reyna, if you all aren't familiar with um, both Lumbee singers. They actually came to New Orleans, uh, to the New Orleans Jazz Museum some years ago for an event. Um, and then Alexis was uh, part of, she was on American Idol, uh, competed on American Idol, but she had a song out that talked about murdered and, and missing indigenous women. And um, it's called Keep My Memory. And I would love for you to just talk about that because you know one of the challenges we have all in the media as well as um, just you know getting um, nationwide recognition for what happens to indigenous and African American women when they go missing or they're murdered. Yes, um, you know it's almost impossible to describe the disparity between the coverage that white Americans get when one of their girls or young women go missing or murdered and the attention that black and indigenous people get when one of our women or girls goes missing or murdered. Um, you know, the and that disparity is, it, it makes me angry, um, but it also, I think makes me more determined or focused in some ways on trying to, well, there's several things to do. You know, it's not that we are helpless in the face of this problem. Um, I think one of the things that will change policies to, to better protect black and native women will be to begin to reverse the impression or the belief that black and native women are disposable or not worth saving. Um, I think that you know you have a host of stereotypes which are deeply ingrained in native well in American society around um, the sexual availability of black and native women, around the um, our reputations as, as worth our work, but not our, our souls, you know, that our value is primarily for the work that we do or the labor that we carry or the, the burdens we bear rather than for our gifts or um, our talents or what we bring to a community. And so um, people like Charlie and even my own daughter, Lydia, in her own little way, <laughs> you know, are challenging those stereotypes through their art and through their, um, through their presence, through their existence. Sometimes my, my daughter's like, mom, why can't I go to the protest? <laughs> and I say, well, your existence is a protest. Um, and, you know, when you keep doing that exactly the way you are doing it and continuing to be 
to be proud of who you are, not because her purpose is not to defy stereotypes, her purpose is just to be, you know, and to be creative and to be uh, engaged and to be joined in service with others to make, make this place better, you know? And when we see more and more and more images of Black and Native women in those roles rather than in the stereotyped roles, that's one of the ingredients I hope to, to move a needle on so that when, um, well, not just when missing and miss, not when kidnapping or, or murder occurs, but really when um, people are, when people are thinking about the value of women in our society that Black and Native women are part of that picture and that they are afforded what we think of as true equal protection under the law. Um, and I think part, you know, that, so that's, you know, there's a lot can, that can be done to, to ensure that Black and Native women get equal protection under the law. But part of it, I think, is beginning to provide safe spaces for women to show up with everything that they are um, and I think part of it is also changing the story that we tell about the role of Black and Native women in our society. And that you all, thank you all so much and for listening and tuning in. Uh, Dr. Lowry, we respect, highly admire your work, and we thank you so much for all that you do and just, you know, and just being such an incredible scholar and really just championing, um, you know, and putting out more uh, research, you know, your, all of your books, your documentary. We, we just appreciate you so much. I'm a super fan girly still, but well, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate you. And I appreciate all y'all for showing up tonight. And homecoming or, and, and, or Powell or something, you know, or when I'm be yeah. homecoming, that's the best way to experience who we are. I think. Yes. Yeah. So thank you. And I know it's late in Atlanta, so I won't keep you. And I know you have to go. Um, but I, we thank you. The, and we will um, have this on our YouTube channel for anybody who wasn't able to uh, see the complete uh, recording. So thank you so much and have a good evening. Great to see y'all. Bye. Bye.